Hi guys. Imagine that. It is another foggy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. We ought to call the sunshine state the fog state. And it is Thursday morning, December 9th, 2021. The little dog has got something cornered up there. A little snake killing dog is killing something else. He said he had no time for this rant today. So anyway, uh, did I say it's Thursday, December 9th, 2021? So yesterday, I uh, sent out a big thank you to my fellow collapsitarian, Dave Gardner, over at Growth Busters. Uh, he has an occasional blog, and on his blog, he had links to some some very good articles. So I read an article yesterday by uh, Professor William Reese. If you did not hear that uh, that essay, I definitely suggest you go listen to that one. And this is kind of a companion piece. There's going to be a little bit of overlap between the information and that and this one. Uh, but the more people we have uh, with brains uh, telling us about the, situ the state of the planet here at the end of 2021, uh, the better. So this fellow is an ecologist and a journalist and one of the co-founders of Greenpeace Canada. His name is Rex Weiler, I guess, W-E-Y-L-E-R, never heard of this man, uh, Rex Weiler, and this is from resilience.org, this excellent website I've read from many times, resilience.org, and in this uh, essay, Rex is asking the question, why is the political process so slow to respond to our ecological crisis? Well, before we dive into Rex, I'm just going to give the short Cliff Notes answer. Is that the political process is bought and sold by the global corporatocracy? Okay, this is not a, not, not a difficult concept. The, the planet-eating global corporatocracy that is 100% dependent on infinite growth on a finite planet owns the global political process. It owns the United Nations and all the rest of them. This is why there is going to be no political solution to the collapse of a planet. They are the, the politicians are in the pocket of the very people whose economic survival depends on the destruction and obliteration of all life on Earth. So that is the short answer, but we're going to get a little bit more of an in-depth answer by Rex Weiler. Why is the political process so slow to respond to our ecological crisis? <clears throat> All right. We may point out that most political, I would say all, we may point out that most political processes are hobbled by corruption, self-interest, and bureaucratic incompetence. And that's three other reasons to answer the question. However, there may be, there may be, that's his way of understating, there is a deeper reason connected to how the status quo protects itself, not just against foreign aggressors, but against dissident ideas that threaten its accepted narrative. 
Thank you. Now, uh, again, uh, William Reese alluded to this, and to this, the, the, the very idea that you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet is the most terrifying dissident idea to the global corporatocracy. The global corporatocracy is 100% dependent on promoting the big fat green lie that you can have infinite growth on a finite planet. Anybody who questions that is a dissident that needs to be silenced. I am a dissident voice. Okay, so is Rex Weiler, William Reese, Tim Garrett. Okay, back to uh, Rex. <clears throat> okay, regarding our ecological problems, the popular narrative of most science, of most societies and governments today is that we have a quote, climate problem, which can be solved with renewable technologies such as windmills, carbon capture, and efficient batteries. However, <coughs> global heating is a symptom, is one symptom of a much larger, more fundamental ecological crisis articulated by William Reese, and then that links us over to the one I read yesterday, articulated by William Reese, the limits to growth study, the post-carbon institute, and other ecologically aware observers. <clears throat> Humanity's urgent and primary challenge is what ecologists call, this is your pop quiz from yesterday, overshoot. The predicament of any species that grows beyond the capacity of its environment. Wolves overshoot the prey in their watershed. <clears throat> Algae overshoot the nutrient capacity of a lake, and humanity has overshot the entire capacity of Earth. Global heating, the biodiversity crisis, depleted soils, and disappearing forests are all symptoms of ecological overshoot. All paths out of overshoot, genuine solutions, involve a contraction of the species and a decline of material and energy throughput. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions to the overshoot rule. You overshoot your environment's ability to sustain your, uh, your population and your lifestyle, you will crash and burn. There are no exceptions to this rule. And uh, any clueless moron human thinking that we are going to be the one exception to this rule in the history of this planet got some bad news for you. Back to Rex. <clears throat> Furthermore, the contraction of humanity is inevitable. So all genuine options exist within this framework, whether we respond appropriately or not. And finally, every day that we ignore this reality, the deeper humanity falls into the overshoot rut, the faster the feedbacks take over, can you say forest fires and methane from melting permafrost? And the less, the less chance we have of mitigation. 
In several cases, scientists and other colleagues who have attempted to introduce these facts in political settings have told me, quote, it is a non-starter. They do not want to hear it, close quote. Okay, that reveals a deeper problem political inertia and the paradigm trap. If mentioning the real problem to any given group that wants to help is a non-starter, I cannot imagine how that group is ever going to be effective. In my experience, this is how the status quo maintains itself not necessarily with conspiracy or evil plotting, although those phenomena do exist, but rather with social gravity, pulling every alternative idea or narrative toward itself until the alternative idea is safely inside the event horizon and there is no escape. The capitalist growth status quo black hole has virtually gobbled up the entire environmental movement and the civil rights movement this way. This is why I am not an environmentalist. This is why I correct people whenever they call me an environmentalist. The mainstream environmental movement spouting this crap, that this bright green lie crap has been completely gobbled up into the global corporatocracy's black hole. They are, the, 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 these, uh, the, the, these mainstream environmentalists are every bit as guilty and morally reprehensible to me as climate change deniers. <clears throat> Politicians reach out to scientists for an articulation of our problems but then typically reject the warnings from scientists if those warnings violate the accepted paradigm. This is the Sandhill Crane joining in on the rant, and this is exactly what I talk about with the United Nations, that I do not, when I talk trash about the United Nations, I am not talking about the scientists behind the United Nations. Their only problem is they're too conservative. But other than that, uh, the problem is not the science backing up all of these dire UN reports. It, it, it is the, the quote, policy makers that ignore everything the scientists say because it violates their accepted infinite growth on a finite uh, planet paradigm. Back to Rex. The message from serious ecological science suggests that a clear understanding of overshoot is absolutely essential for anyone or any group hoping to understand the problem. Non-starter or not, I suggest it would help anyone attempting to influence governments to have a one-pager on overshoot available for everyone, to distribute it relentlessly, and to articulate it at every opportunity. Do not wait until it is acceptable. Paul Ehrlich bravely and brilliantly warned humanity of the population crisis in the 1960s and tried to get the topic on the UN agenda in Stockholm in 1972 and almost succeeded, but was sabotaged by people, including Barry Commoner, who claimed the subject, though correct, 
was a non-starter. So here we are, 50 years down the road, having wasted half a century on pretending with the population having doubled and material throughput quadrupled. Meanwhile, we have wasted 42 years of climate meetings, allowing political appointees to avoid the real dilemma while pretending that carbon capture and mechanical efficiencies would solve the erroneously described problem. A leading environmental leader once told me that, although true, she could get, quote, no traction with the overshoot warning or with population issues. I sympathize, but my response was and still is, what good is traction if you're going down the wrong road? Sometimes the traction is to help with fundraising, but I don't believe that funding is the solution. As often as not, funding is the problem because the funding represents a huge packet of energy, resources, and person power. So if the funding is creating traction down the wrong road, text tech fixes, better lives for 9, 10, 12 billion people, a marginally more benign American or European empire, it is part of the problem. So the articulation of the problem includes this. We don't have another half century to quibble. Governments claim to care about risk mitigation, but ignoring the real dilemma is the biggest risk of all. It is like turning on the air conditioner when the house is on fire. I believe most of the solutions that will matter will be local. Learn to grow food, grow food, learn about energy, reduce energy throughput, build up local and regional energy sources, protect local ecosystems, build community cohesion, establish systems to create soil, enrich the soil, recycle everything locally, reduce material throughput, and do not forget set local limits on growth. Virtually none of this can be achieved globally, but there still exist useful global efforts, including efforts to inform governments of the genuine challenges. I would engage in any global effort that is realistic about the problems we face. In that case, what are the global priorities? My list starts with universal women's rights available contraception, a global promotion campaign for small families to address unrestrained population growth, a vast reduction of militarism and weapons manufacturing, reduce psychopathic behavior in governments and institutions, good luck, limit corporate power in government and in ecological regulation, good luck, reduce and eliminate frivolous consumption, good luck, and so forth. I suggest that to be effective, all this has to be done within the biophysically, ecologically correct context. Humanity is in a state of overshoot, getting worse daily, and all paths out, all genuine solutions include a large-scale contraction of the human enterprise. So when you lobby your government for action, don't equivocate. 
if your government ignores you because you s insist on bringing up these issues, it is better to find out now rather than in another decade or half century. Amen, uh, Rex Weiler. Uh, preaching to the choir. Uh, here are some related posts uh, here on resilience.org. Uh, inflationary pressure in the U.S. In praise of laziness, the era of cheap living is over. Uh, tech won't save us. Shrinking consumption will. How much of the worsening energy crisis is due to depletion? Anyway, I have got to spend more time on resilience.org. It is a true treasure trove of doomsday sermons that I have got to wrap up this doomsday sermon because my little dog has gotten strangely quiet and I want to find out uh, what the little assassin is up to today. Yes, I hear you, you little assassin. Get out there and enjoy your overshoot while you still can. I got to go get some damn tires put on my truck. Bye, guys.